cool environment. Um, so, uh, uh, one Corinthians chapter, sorry, two Corinthians chapter five, and verse one. We know, now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now it is God who has made us for this very purpose, and has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we're at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Well now, let's, let's pray. Oh Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have this morning to consider your word together. We pray, please, that you will enable your word to be taught helpfully and in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we do pray, Lord, that you will also cause us all to hear what you have to say to us. We pray that you will work in us all by your Spirit. Give us believing hearts that, Lord, we might be changed by what we hear this morning. We ask these things through our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, in this passage, the Apostle Paul speaks about the great comfort that we who are believers have as we face death. For us, death is not a defeat or a disaster. Rather, it is a transition out of our earthly body to a new dwelling place in heaven as we await the resurrection. There we will be in the presence of Christ and we shall also be with other believers who have died ahead of us. We shall be completely free from suffering and pain. We shall be perfect and then when Jesus comes again, we are souls which have been in paradise with the Lord, will then be reunited with our bodies, and we will enjoy the new heavens and the new earth that God is going to bring into being. This is a very important passage for us to hear. Every one of us is going to have to face death unless the Lord returns before we die. Many believers really struggle with death. They feel that somehow to die is to be defeated. They feel that they should be able to claim healing from the Lord. And they ask and they ask and they ask for that healing. And when in their final illness that healing doesn't appear to be coming, they then feel desperately depressed and defeated and feel as though that they have perhaps not had enough faith, perhaps they've been some sort of sin that they've committed, which is stopping God from hearing them. And rather than passing out triumphantly and gloriously 
into the next life, they die with a whimper and with, 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 with great unhappiness, feeling utterly defeated and as though they've let God down and as though perhaps God has let them down. Now, in previous generations, believers knew how to die well. And often as they died, family would be gathered around, they'd be praying, they'd be singing, and often they would go to the Lord with great triumph. But sadly, sometimes, not always, but sometimes in our own generation, we seem to have lost the ability to die well. So I do hope that you will listen very carefully to what is said this morning. If you are a believer, what is said could really strengthen you for when you come to the point where you need to die. Now, of course, we need to hear these things now because when you are actually dying, you'll be on your hospital bed or you'll be on your bed at home and you won't be able to come to hear God's word. You won't be well enough to listen even to a YouTube service, even if you've got connection when you're in hospital. So you need to have that pre-teaching now, as it were, so that you're prepared and you're ready, so that when your time comes, you will know what to do. And also, we need to have this teaching because we need to know how to respond when we see brothers and sisters going on ahead of us. Some Christians are really thrown when they hear of another believer, especially a member of the church or a member of the family who's been a believer, they, that, that one dies, especially if that one perhaps dies youngish. They're really thrown and think, oh no, what's gone wrong? Has some terrible disaster happened? And so uh, we, need to have, we need to hear this teaching from that point of view as well. And also, if you're not yet a Christian, you need to hear this teaching. Because the Lord could use what he said this morning to awaken you to your need to be saved and to bring you to faith in Christ. Now let me just say a, a word about the context. Uh, the Apostle Paul, this passage here, comes in Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. And this letter has a great deal to say about the whole matter of suffering and death. The Apostle speaks, makes numerous references to death in this, in, this le in this letter. For example, in chapter 1 and verse 8, if you go back a, a page or two, you'll see there that he says, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, in our hearts we felt the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. And then in chapter 4 and verse uh, 10, he says, We always carry around in our body the death of our Lord Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body for we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus sake so that his life may be revealed in our mortal in mortal body so then death is at work in us but life is at work in you and then in verses 5 16 to 18, he speaks about how he is wasting away outwardly, but he's comforted to know that these the sorrows of this life are enhancing his future glory. He says, verse 16, therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles 
are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Well, that leads us to the passage that we're thinking about this morning. And the passage that we're thinking about this morning, I think we can divide into two main halves. First of all, we have truths about our life before and after death, which we have in verses 1 to 5. And then we have how these truths should affect us, which we have in verses 6 to 8. So let's think about those, uh, those two sections. Now, and under the first main section... Under the first main section, we have four things that we see about life now and life as it will be at the resurrection. And the apostle heads this up with a little phrase, we know. We know that if the, verse 1, that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed. We have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. We know. Now, you might be familiar with the Bible, how the apostle uses this phrase, we know, when he's talking about things which are f- about fundamental truths which every Christian should know. Unfortunately, although We should know these things. We often don't know these things. Romans 8.28 We know that in all things God works for good with those who love him and are called according to his purpose. This is a really important foundational truth. So again, this one here. We know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have an eternal house in heaven not built by human hands. But I wonder, do you know that? Do you know these things? You should know these things. These things should be sort of Christians, the Christians ABC of the gospel. It's a sort of Sunday school stuff that we should know. But do you know this? I'm addressing you children. Do you know this? You should know it. And those of us who are older, we should know these things that the apostle is talking about here in in uh, the, this section. So let's, let's note four things that the Apostle says we know, he knows, and that, that you should know and that I should know. First of all, he says, our life in our present bodies is temporary and difficult. He says, he talks about our bodies, our present bodies, as a tent. He says, we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed. Earthly tent. Now, what is that? That earthly tent is our body. We've got souls. Those are, our souls are everlasting. But when we are on earth, in in this present life, our souls are living in human earthly bodies. And those bodies, he says, are tents. Now, a tent is a temporary and weak structure. It easily is blown away. If you have a if you have a tent and you're out in a gale force 10 wind, your tent may well get blown away or the tent poles might get broken. It doesn't last very long. It rots. It gets torn. And so it is with our bodies. They are temporary. They are weak. They get ill. They wear out. 
they die. In Psalm 90 verse 10, uh, Moses says, The length of our days is 70 years or 80 if we have the strength, yet their span is but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. Like a tent blown away by a gale force wind. We fly away, we're gone. We're finished very soon. Interesting, isn't it? That psalm was written 4,000 years ago, and yet life expectancy hasn't actually changed very much in those 4,000 years, in spite of improvements in medical, uh, medical practice. But not only is a tent a very temporary structure, it's also a very uncomfortable structure. If you, uh, it's all very well if you're on a summer holiday in the south of France and the sun is shining. But if you're shivering away in Scotland and the rain is coming down, even in midsummer you're not going to be very comfortable and certainly on a day like this, in a tent, you're not going to be comfortable. And so it is with our bodies. Our bodies are uncomfortable places for us to be. The apostle describes this in verse 2. He says, meanwhile, we groan. We groan. We're not comfortable. There's something in us which is like, oh... There is pain involved, isn't there? Living in these bodies that we have. When we're young and healthy, of course, it's not too bad. But as we grow older, though, though, though our bodies get weaker, we get more prone to illness, we get more tired. Life is difficult in the body. He says in verse 4, Meanwhile, we... While we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened. That's the situation of living in this life, groaning and burdened. We get tired with hard work. Many of us suffer from financial uh, difficulties. Uh, we uh, maybe suffer the effects of crime. We get ill. We struggle with sin. We perhaps have family problems. We may be the victims of crime and persecution. Why is this? Well, the answer is that we are feeling in our bodies the effect of sin. Sin has, has had an effect of, of cursing our bodies and bringing this point of weakness. If, if Adam hadn't have sinned, our bodies would be strong and healthy to this day. But sin has brought terrible effects to our bodies. You might say, but surely we've been saved from sin. Surely Christ died for us and when we trust in Jesus, we're saved. Yes, that's true. But nevertheless, we still feel in our bodies the effect of our sin and that is not going to be removed until we leave our bodies and go to be with the Lord. And ultimately, we will experience the resurrection of the body. Romans 8 verse 22, the apostle says, We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Our bodies have not yet been redeemed. We're waiting for that. So that's the first thing we see, that our present lives are difficult. Secondly, we see in this first half, the Apostle says that we have a wonderful home waiting for us in heaven. He says, now we know, 
that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Now, what's this talking about? Uh, we might think that it's talking about uh, the resurrection body. At first, that we think that's what it's talking about. A heavenly body that we're going to be given. But it doesn't actually quite tie up with that because this is, this is an eternal house in heaven. Uh, the resurrection body is going to be an earthly body recreated from the earth and, and transformed. But this is, a, this is something else. This is a heavenly home. Moreover, this is something which starts immediately we die. It's clear from that. If we look carefully at the passage, we see that this is something, a, a home that we enter into immediately upon death. If, verse 1, if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed... We have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven. There is that home there waiting for us in heaven from the moment this body is destroyed. Not waiting till the resurrection. That is there waiting for us and ready for us for when we die. And then verse 2. Meanwhile we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. Because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. So, when we die, the soul will leave the body. But the soul will not be naked. The soul will not be homeless, as it were. The soul, having left this body, will immediately have somewhere else to reside. A heavenly place to reside. Now, we don't know quite what that will be. We don't know how that will work out. But there is some way in which the soul will be accommodated in heaven. Verse 4. For while we are in this tent, we groan on our burden because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. So again we see that we are groaning because we are looking forward to that time when, following death, will be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. And then also, verse 6, Therefore we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. So while we are in the body, this earthly body, we are away from the Lord. We don't have that presence of the Lord. But when we depart from the body, then we will be at home with the Lord in that heavenly dwelling place. And then also uh, verse 8. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away, away from the body and at home with the Lord. So all these different ways, this, this, this passage is saying that there is a heavenly home waiting for us for immediately when we die. Not for some time in the future, but immediately you die, we, are, we will be ushered into this heavenly home, this heavenly dwelling. And uh, this is something which is taught in other places as well. Uh, for example, uh, do you remember how Jesus said to the thief as he was dying on the cross and the thief said to me remember me when you come in your kingdom and Jesus said to him today you will be with me in paradise do you remember also the story of the rich man and Lazarus it was recorded in Luke 16 Lazarus died and he was carried by the angels to Abraham's side, where he was comforted. And this was happening while 
the rich man's brothers were still alive on earth. So it's not talking about the resurrection. We're talking about between death and the resurrection, Lazarus was in the presence of Abraham. And surely also that means in the presence of Christ. Presence of God. And Abraham said he was comforted. He knew where he was. He knew what was going on. And Paul also says in Philippians chapter 3, And verse 20, so not Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 1, and verse 20, he says, I eagerly hope, expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but I will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I begin to go on living in the body, it will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. So we see the apostle is saying that 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 death immediately takes him into the presence of Christ. He's got that expectation that he will have something far better than this earthly life. He'll be taken into the presence of Christ. Now, why have I made this, why have I, um, made this point in such detail? The reason why I've made this point, you might think, well, did we really need to have this detail? Yes, we did, because there are a large number of Christians who teach what is called soul sleep. They pick up on, 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 on a word which, which is used sometimes to describe death, which is, you know, Jesus says, for example, about Jairus' daughter, she's not dead but asleep. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4 that those who've died have fallen asleep. And what these believers say is, that what happens is when you die, your soul goes to sleep and you lose consciousness and you're, as it were, in a sort of like suspended animation, your soul is asleep and then uh, you, so you, 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 you don't know where you are, what's happening to you from the moment you die, they say, until the resurrection morning. And then, and then just like when you've been asleep at, at night, you've been dreaming, you've not been know what's happened, the time's just gone like, like a flash, and they say once you, at the resurrection morning, then you'll wake up, and then you'll become conscious again. Now that is not the teaching of Scripture. The teaching of Scripture in 2 Corinthians, as we've seen, those other passages that we've seen, other passages I could point to you to in Revelation, talk about the saints praying under the altar, those who've died already. The teaching of Scripture is that when the believer dies, he or she is ushered straight into the presence of Christ. He or she has a heavenly home to go to where he or she will enjoy the presence of the Lord and will be comforted and will know that he or she is there and will know the others who are there already. So here is a wonderful hope. Now, moving on. Third thing we see under this main heading of what the what what we what about this what we learn about this life and the life to come is that we were made for the purpose of heaven. Verse 5. Now God whom has made us for this very purpose. We were made for the purpose of having a heavenly life. You know, sometimes people regard their lives as though this life is all that really matters. 
And the life to come is almost like a sort of postscript, a sort of like a PS, an afterthought. And so they try to pack in as much as they can into this life. And of course, this is the, this is the idea of the world. The world says, oh, you've got to enjoy as much as you can now because this is your only chance. And sometimes some Christians can start to feel that way. They think, well, if I don't do this now, I never will be able to. No, there is something far, far better to come. God has made us for the purpose of heaven, of glory. And what we're going through now is just the foretaste. It's just the preamble. It's just the introduction to the real life which is going to start when we die. And then the fourth thing we see in terms of what we know, the truths, is that God has given us the Holy Spirit to guarantee what is to come. Uh, verse 5, now it, is God has made it, now it is God who has made us for this very purpose and has given us the Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. If you are a Christian, if you have been born again, you've got the Holy Spirit living inside you. The Holy Spirit giving you his joy, giving you his peace, giving you the knowledge of the love of God. And that experience of the Holy Spirit in your life is a deposit, it's a down payment. Now, when, when someone buys a house, what usually happens is that they give over to the seller 10% of the value of the house. That's a deposit. And what that deposit is saying is there's going to be more money that comes. So they sign the contract and they say, here's a deposit to say that we're buying this house. And then when the sale is completion, when you hand over the, when completed, you ha uh, uh, then, then the, the keys are handed over, we will put the money into your account. And that's going to be the remainder. Now the, the, the Holy Spirit is that deposit. He gives us a taste of heaven, a foretaste of heaven. He gives us that joy. He gives us that peace. He gives us the knowledge of the love of God. And he's saying, this is, there's going to be more of this to come. It's the guarantee. You know that if you're a Christian, if you're born again, you know you're going to go to heaven. You can be sure you're going to go to heaven when you die because you've been given the Holy Spirit as a guarantee of what is to come. So there are these four things then under this first main heading. These four things that we, <coughs> that we know, or at least we should know. First of all, life here in our present body is difficult and temporary. Secondly, when we die, we will be taken immediately into the presence of Christ. And we've got a home waiting for, a lovely, beautiful, spiritual home waiting for our souls in paradise. Thirdly, we were created for the purpose of entering heaven. And fourthly, we've been given the Holy Spirit as a guarantee of what is to come. Now, let's now then think about what the Apostle says about how we are to live in the light of these things. Verses 6 to 10. Now, we saw how the Apostle said earlier in the first section, we know, implying what we should know. Now in the second half, verses 6 to 10, he talks about what we do. Now again, in the same way, just as when he said, we know, he's saying, this is what you should know. When he says, what we, what we do, he's saying, what we who are believers should be doing. Now again, I ask you, are you doing these things? You should be doing these things, I should be doing these things, but are you and are and am I? 
Well, let's think about these four things that the apostle says that we should be doing. First of all, he says, we should be confident. Verse 6, therefore we are always confident and know that as long as we're at home in the body, we're away from the Lord. He says we are confident or we should be confident. We should be looking forward. That confidence is not to be a confidence in ourselves or in our own strength, but that confidence is to be in the Lord and what he has done for us and what he will be doing for us when we die. We should not be afraid as we approach our own death and we should not be afraid for other, for our brothers and sisters as they prepare and approach for, approach, uh, prepare for and approach their deaths. Nor should we grieve for those who are believers who have already died in the way that unbelievers grieve for their loved ones when they die. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13, the apostle says, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We don't need to grieve like they do. We do grieve, of course, because we miss those who've died. We wish that they could be with us still. Of course, that's only natural. But we don't need to grieve for them. They're okay. If, 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 if your brother or your sister in Christ who's died could speak to you, he or she would say to you, don't worry about me, I'm fine. I'm great here, I'm having a wonderful time in the presence of Christ and in the presence of his people. You might feel sorry for yourselves because I'm not here anymore, but don't worry about me, I'm great. So we can be confident in the face of death. Secondly, we should live by faith and not by sight. Verse 7, we live by faith, not by sight. The apostle says that what guides him and what should guide us in the way he thinks and the way he lives is his faith in Christ, not the things that he can see. In other words, what influences his thinking and his actions is the truth that he will one day be with Christ. And he receives that truth by faith. Now, we're very prone, aren't we, all of us, certainly I am, to be influenced by our circumstances. If we are feeling healthy and we've got some money in the bank, we've got a happy family life, we're not living in, in, in under threat of persecution, our home is, is ordered and, and, and comfortable, then we tend to feel happy. But if we start to suffer ill health, or if we are bereaved, or if we have trouble in our family life, or we suffer poverty or persecution, it's very easy for us to be influenced by those things and to start to feel sorry for ourselves. But we can and should learn from the example of the apostle. We need to learn to walk by faith and not by sight, not to be guided by things that we can see or feel or touch, not to be guided by the here and now, but rather to be guided by spiritual things that are seen by faith. Thirdly, we, sh we, should, we see from what the Apostle says that we should long to be with the Lord. Verse 8, we are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Can you honestly say that? You'd prefer to die and to be with Christ. That's what the apostle says. We should actually prefer that. We should actually want that more than to live in Karen living in this life. Now, is this some sort of suicide wish? No, of course not. It is wrong to want to, to take your own life. And when uh, believers 
are recorded in the, in, the, in, the, in the Old Testament as having wanted to die. They are gently reproved by God. Jeremiah was gently reproved by God and, 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 and told to repent. Elijah also was gently reproved by God. Also Jonah also gently reproved by God. No, we shouldn't want to commit suicide out of some sort of negative hatred of this life. But we should have a, 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 a happy anticipation of going to be with the Lord. If I can use the illustration of, of, of giving birth, not of course that I have any experience, but I, I am told that a mother, of course, is not, who, an expectant mother is not looking forward to the process of labor. The pain she knows is going to be terrific and terrible. But nevertheless, there is an excitement and anticipation, which in a sense is making her think, I can't wait for this to happen. Not because she wants to go through the labor, but because she's looking forward to the child that God willing will be born the other side of that experience of labor. And so it is with us. We who are Christians, we don't, we don't have any death wish. We don't, we don't love death. And we don't want to commit suicide or anything like that. No, not at all. We are happy to live in this life and we're happy to serve God in this life for as long as he leaves us in this life. And we do what we can to preserve our lives so that we can be useful to God. But when that time comes, when God makes it clear that it's going to be our time for, to leave this world, then we look forward. We're glad. Because now soon our troubles will be open, soon we'll be with the Lord, and soon we shall uh, have that wonderful experience of being in his presence. And then the fourth thing we see under the practical application of what Paul says is we make it our aim to please God. He says in verses 9 and 10, so we make it our, old, our goal to please him whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. The believer who is looking forward to, the res to, to, to being with Christ makes it his aim to please the Lord. Whether he lives or whether he dies. You might say, but how can I glorify God by dying? Surely I can only glorify God by carrying on living and, and by serving him on earth. No, you can glorify God by dying and in the way that you die. Some people in the way that they die achieve more than they have achieved in the entire of their life. And their, their death, the way they died is recorded and, and remembered by, by many people for many years and has a profound impact upon many people. If we die trusting Christ and giving thanks to him and, and rejoicing in his goodness and knowing his peace and his love, this can do tremendous good to our family, friends and those who know us. So we should make it our aim to please him. Whatever we do, whether if we live, we, ple we make it our aim to please him. We make it our aim to glorify God. If we die, we also make it our aim to please God in the way in which we die. And the reason is because we will all need to give an account to him for the way that we've done, uh, while, the way we've lived while we've been in the body. Well, so then we've seen then that for the b believer, death is not a terrible disaster. Death ushers the believer into the presence of Christ. He is given a home to live in, in paradise. All his suffering is over. 
he starts the heavenly life which then will continue at the resurrection when his soul is reunited with his body. So if you are a believer, be encouraged. Follow the example of the Apostle Paul as you face your own death and as you see other believers facing their death. Let these words comfort you in the loss of any loved one who is a believer who has died. But finally, I must say a word to any who are, as yet do not trust in Christ for salvation. All that I've said today only applies to those who've repented of their sin and who trust in Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. It only applies to those who have been truly born again. If you've not been saved and if you are not born again, then far from death being in the entrance into life, death for you will be the entrance to terrible suffering in Hades as you wait the final judgment and then punishment in hell. Many call, who call themselves atheists and agnostics whistle in the dark and say, oh, once you're dead, you're dead. But that's not true. You've got an everlasting soul which will never die. And if your soul is not saved, then it will go to Hades where it will suffer. Remember the rich man in the story of the rich man and Lazarus who died and woke up in Hades and he saw Lazarus far off at Abraham's side in paradise and begged Abraham to send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and place it on his tongue. He said, because I'm in agony here in these flames. You don't need to suffer this way though. God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross in the place of sinners. Come to Jesus. Trust in him. Let him take your sins. So that this hope that we've talked about, that those who die go straight into the presence of Christ, might become your hope. So that you might be able to face death with peace and joy. Knowing that when you die, you will be going straight into the presence of Christ. Well, we're going to um, sing now our final hymn, uh, or at least I will, and encourage you to follow along.